started, I just want to say personally how much I appreciate giving this time. Honestly, it means a lot to me. It's just like this is the second time in my own career where, um, you know, people really stepped up to allow me to do something like this. Uh, Dr. Benson allowed me to come and speak to uh, his continuing medical education courses in mind-body medicine starting in 2005. Um, I've been doing that ever since. And just about two years ago, we introduced the vitamin G lecture uh, within the medical school CME. So we're excited about that. I can't actually lay claim to coining the term. Uh, it was out, it was in Europe first, but we're trying to certainly popularize it, that's for sure, um, and, and bring the message well, forward. Yes, exactly, right. exactly. Gee, it's, it's all good, right? So um, as Dr. Spengler uh, mentioned, I'm actually going to sort of talk a little bit, it'd be an appetizer in many ways for what will unfold through the rest of the, the, rest of the day. Uh, and in particular, I will focus in on some of these medicinal aspects of nature and green space. And we'll talk about some of the, the emerging science of where neuroscience are actually looking at the brain while it is on nature, if you will. We'll get to that right away. And then we'll talk about some of the public health uh, implications as well. I'll be delving into, sorry, into a lot of the uh, experts' fields here as I go through my, um, my talk. So again, thank you very much for giving me the time. So the brain on nature. Now, there's been four of these MRI studies to date. And the long and the short of it is actually quite simple. They put these young individuals into an MRI scanner. They give them a two-minute block of either nature, rural scenes, or a two-minute block of the urban built environment. And they're not stacking the deck. There's no graffiti or garbage or anything like that inside the, uh, the urban built scenes. Right? They're just typically bricks and mortar, glass, some street scenes, and so on. But it is not, not an act of contemplation, right? Because the image is being presented to these people in the MRI scanner every 1.5 seconds for the block of nature rural, and then every 1.5 seconds for two minutes for the urban environment, right? So essentially, you're really tapping in to the initial, the immediate, the visceral response of the brain at that image, right? Again, no time for contemplation. And what you're really trying to do here with this in many ways is to provide some sense of validation to the biophilia hypothesis, right? Which is Edward O. Wilson, the famous Harvard biologist, who stated that it's very likely that human beings have an innate, meaning it's built right into our DNA, and an emotional relationship to nature. And why wouldn't we? For 2.2 million years, our genus has been in nature being sheltered by, you know, clothes, sustained. Certainly we've had to run from it, and that fear is also evident as well. Uh, and we can get into that in terms of aspects of time. Prof Professor Beatley can certainly speak better to that than I can. Not every element of nature is suitable in design. And we'll talk about that later. So what they found was that with the nature scenes, you were actually seeing an increased activity in areas of the brain associated with emotional stability, okay? And in particular, the insula, which is referred to by many neuroscientists as the love area of the brain, okay? Because not every time, but most times, when you bring in uh, otherwise healthy adults into an MRI scanner and you show them pictures of their loved ones or you show them pictures of their beloved pets, the insula becomes very active. That's why they call it the love area of the brain. In all of the studies, the insula was consistently activated, okay? The insula, by the way, is also associated with empathy, right? There's other research indicating that it enhanced uh, uh, insula activity. In, in fact, in those who get into contemplative exercises, mindfulness exercises, with experience, the insula becomes more active, okay? Now, that didn't happen with the urban-built environment. On the flip side, the urban-built environment, every study fired up the amygdala, which is the fear center of the brain, right? In those with anxiety and depressive disorders in both conditions, the amygdala is more active. And as they get better through various interventions, the amygdala activity, the dial gets turned down. So it's interesting findings, right? I mean, these are the type of, of areas of the brain with nature that were being fired up again to happy faces or pleasure or positive memories and so on. There's more research uh, coming out as well, it was just published a few weeks ago where Scottish researchers followed a group of young adults as they transitioned in Glasgow from urban built through an urban park and back to urban built again. 
And it was really neat because they had wireless devices where they could look at the EEG patterns. And as they transitioned into the natural setting, the green space, sure enough, the EEG patterns changed that would be more reflective of a meditative state. It was higher alpha wave activity. So it's really neat to start to see some of these things that the, that the neuroscience is getting on board with this. Um, because you know the background to the entire discussion is we can't all assume, I know all of us together in this room are likely on the same page with this, but we can't assume that if we're trying to affect change, if we're trying to pr provide uh, design policy uh, to officials that ultimately put the stamp yay or nay on it, you need to have science to validate what it is that you're trying to say. So in some sense, it's remarkable that we would have to apply neuroscience to this type of thing, but it's critically important. Now, Robert Ulrich is a very famous scientist in this particular field. In many ways, he, he put it on the map. Uh, he, he was a geographer, actually, uh, but he, he got into the effects of green space in, in healthcare settings and so on. And his studies got the ball rolling here. He found that if uh, you stressed out young university students, whether on purpose at their final exam period or through having them watch fairly graphic workplace accident videos, and then they would go into one of two different rooms, and if they went into a room and viewed nature scenes, the return to normalcy of stress physiology was more rapid relative uh, to the group who viewed the urban built environment. And there's been lots of studies that have backed that up since. Lower levels of the stress hormone cortisol in particular. And his most famous study, very briefly, you may be aware of this study, and this is the famous hospital study. He collected 11 years of data at a Pennsylvania hospital. And the nice thing about that study was everyone had the same procedure. It was removal of the gallbladder. And essentially, after that fairly straightforward procedure, they were either wheeled to the left or the right out of the OR into recovery. One room on one wing of the hospital had a view to a mini forest, and the other view was out the window to another red brick, right? You were essentially looking at another wing of the hospital. But the light was the same, the size of the rooms were the same, and in the end, there were shorter hospital stays in the folks that were wheeled out to the nature view. And I'm actually quite enjoying this view here because there's loads of greenery for me to have you know, in front of me. Less uh, post-surgical complaints, uh, less potent analgesics. They were using more uh, over-the-counter stuff and less prescription medications in that group. And then my favorite part of all because it's the dream of everyone to get out of the hospital without negative comments in your chart, is that the nurses placed less negative comments in the charts in those with the nature view. Now, there have been more studies. I don't need to read all this verbatim. It's a fairly wordy slide. But the long and the short of this information in front of you is that there's been similar research as well, including a recent one where appendix removal, that mere uh, the presence of vegetation in the room Right? And these folks didn't know that they were manipulated this way, planted some green in the room or not. And again, it was a similar finding, faster recovery, less pain, less anxiety, and so on. So there's an application in healthcare settings, that's for sure. I'd be remiss in my little portion of today's talk if I didn't talk about Shinrin Yoku, which translates from Japanese as forest bathing or taking in the forest air. And I had the good uh, fortune to go uh, to Japan and meet with uh, all of these researchers that have been conducting this research. They've been doing it now in earnest uh, since uh, about 2005. They're really cranking out quite a few studies since then. And what they do is they have the subjects walk in a forest setting and do the same amount of physical activity as a comparator in the urban built environment. Okay. And some of these studies have been longer, they've been weekend type uh, studies. Some of them have just been a, a day and so on. And they've done now, as it, as it says there, at least a thousand subjects involved in these studies, various forests involved. And in the end, the results are consistent. You're seeing decreased psychological stress after the forest walk, decreased depressive symptoms, and so on, decreased hostility. You feel more vigorous, right? but they're backing it up with objective markers. They're backing it up with lower blood pressure, lower levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll jump up a little bit, and you can see the devices. I mean, this is the sophistication of the forest studies that they're doing. 
This is a little gizmo that measures blood flow up to the frontal cortex, reflecting off the hemoglobin. They're bringing these out into the field, and they're showing that a forest experience changes the blood flow, again, reflective of a meditative state. And I'll back up here. You can see they're doing cortisol testing out in the street here. I know that if I was sitting in a folding chair in the street, my stress hormone would probably be up a little bit because they'd be embarrassed about it. But nevertheless, these are the type of studies that go on. Here you can see this young man in the top right chilling out on a, uh, a recliner there in a city street in Tokyo. And the evidence that from the physiology and so on would back up that he's in a much more relaxed state over here. So this is the type of stuff that, that's out there. And it's nice to see the objective application um, to what might seem just sort of intuitive. And again, these are some of the images as well. I just wanted you to see um, some of those images of how they do the studies. And they also have, very briefly, a 44 forest therapy stations. Now, this is really exciting because these are legitimate, bona fide forest therapy locations. They have all sorts of criteria that they put together in order to get it validated as a forest therapy location. Okay? And if the facilities are correct, and a lot of times that validation involves objective markers. They'll take 30 or 40 people out and see if they had a lowering in their, in their stress hormones and if all other criteria are met, well, you get that designation. And I'll tell you, in future design, I can absolutely see things like this happening. It's a wonderful, wonderful program, and it should be expanded. And you don't necessarily need to take a two-hour trip out of the city in order to get that therapeutic benefit. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So there's also the cognitive benefits. We talked a little bit about some of the emotional, but there's cognitive benefits, and I'm not going to spend tremendous amounts of time on this, but suffice it to say that there's probably now a half a dozen studies where they take individuals, and quite often the MO is this. Psychologists will cognitively stress these adults out, or university students. They'll give them lots of complex math equations, difficult puzzles that are almost impossible to solve, and cognitive fatigue sets in. Doesn't matter how resilient you are, you will get cognitively tired. Now, of course, in ADHD, it's very easy to cognitively fatigue young children, or even adults, with ADHD. And they have done research in a similar vein, where they do this cognitive fatigue up front, and then you take one of two different walks. And typically, the walks have lasted from 30 to 50 minutes, roughly, right? And you go out and then urban green space walk. In this case, it's, there's a massive national park system in Seoul. It, you know, it, it's tremendous. And they did a 50 minute walk through the urban pine forest or the downtown streets. Now, of course, the results showed the expected improvement in mood. That's not a shocker. But they also, when they went back and did the cognitive testing, they found that they were far sharper having had the walk in the green space. And again, there's been about six studies that are here on, on, on this. And all the references to this, by the way, are in the back. I'm not making this up off the top of my head. And if anyone at all ever wants these references, please do contact me. It's, I do answer the emails at the yourbrainonnature.com. Um, so this is another one worth noting. This was an evaluation of over 100 public high schools in Michigan. And up front, the researchers evaluated green out of the window, right? And they looked at the types of green, vegetation versus a mowed lawn. And they looked at that view from the primary classroom and also from the cafeteria. And they found that an individual's scholastic results on standardized state exams was higher if that student had a view to green and not just a mowed lawn a view to a variety, a biodiverse view, essentially, is the long and the short of it. The greater the amount of shrubs, the greater the propensity, the desire to go on to uh, you know, higher education. So these are the little things that, that go on they don't talk about. We already talked about uh, ADHD, and you have the guided walk, the cognitive fatigue up front, and then you have the guided walk. So we won't spend too much time on that. There's been similar studies as well in the realm of depression where they take folks with depression and they go on one of two different walks, an urban built environment or the urban park. 
come back and once again, cognition and mental health is improved after the walk. And then you have to just look at the overall pattern of green space. In an urban environment, how close you live to green space is highly associated with mental health of the individual. Okay? You see the bold right there. If you have less than 10% of green space within a kilometer of your home, you have a 25% greater risk of depression and a 30% greater risk of anxiety disorders. Okay? Because if you're here, it's very likely that you're living in so-called gray space, right? You've got some factories around you. You've got lots of fast food, retail chains, and so on. So now we're talking before about uh, disparity, uh, socioeconomic status disparity. So this is wordy. I'll bring it down to the nitty gritty. The researchers, again from Scotland, looked at the amount of green space in a neighborhood and in at-risk communities, there is a tremendous difference in the amount of green space in the communities, in at-risk communities. You can see it there at the end of this sentence. And I apologize about these slides, they are a bit wordy. But look at the bottom of the last sentence here. The green space in these neighborhoods varied by their postal code as much as 14% in one at-risk community and as high as 74% in the other. And it turned out that the green space was a variable in healthcare. It was a variable for the stress hormone cortisol. The folks who had a little bit of green space had cortisol patterns over a 24 hour period that were reflective of what you would find with someone with PTSD, of someone with anxiety disorders, of someone who's under a lot of stress. The less green space was equal to higher self-reported stress. That's the bottom line. So the self-reports of stress were being matched by the stress hormone cortisol. And very importantly, I think this is a, a critical finding, and it's not the first time the Scottish group has found this. They found it twice. It is true that green space is a facilitator of exercise. There's no question about it. Lots of research there. But it's more than just that. Because these guys have found that these differences in the stress hormones and so on, it's not simply a virtue of more exercise. There are other factors at play. And lastly on this topic about healthy inequality, and then we'll shift gears into the, the spirituality section. Am I doing okay for time? Yes, okay. I'm sorry. So with regard to mortality, cardiovascular disease, this is a very impressive study. It's one of my favorite studies. It was published in The Lancet, one of the most prestigious journals in the world. And what they found was they looked at every major metropolitan city in Scotland and England, right? They were using UK mortality data to determine risk of dying and so on. And then they looked at land use data, green space. Now, of course, as expected, the at-risk communities have a higher risk of dying early from cardiovascular disease and other uh, chronic diseases, okay? But when they looked at how much green space was in that community, the gap was narrowed significantly, right? So if you were at risk but had lots of green space, your risk of dying was narrowed much closer to the affluent communities. And they conclude, at the bottom here, that green space is an independent variable cap capable of saving thousands of lives per year in low-income populations. Okay, it's a very, very important finding. We need more research, and we need to keep funneling in that direction. And just lastly, the Japanese research on the Shinrin-yoku, they're also tying it into immune benefits. If you go out into the forest for a weekend, you get improvements in your natural killer cell activity for a month later. These are your primary defenders against uh, influenza, common cold, and cancer. When they did a day trip to a forest park, the participants had improved natural killer cell activity for a week later. So it's having an, an effect on the immune system as well. Now, let's shift this a bit towards this spirituality angle of things. Because awe, and I don't think we talk enough about awe as an emotion, as a medicinal agent, quite frankly. Awe can be fostered by nature. First, let's define what it is technically, according to the experts. It's a feeling of wonder experienced by the self when you face or see or soak in something that's vast. 
something that's greater than your current understanding, right? You can induce it. If you take 100 otherwise healthy young students, you can induce awe very easily by having them visualize nature, by having them view vistas and scenes of impressive nature, okay? But it doesn't have to be massive. There's a perception that you can only induce awe if you show someone the Grand Canyon, right? No, it has to be beautiful, that's all. And for me, a ladybug on the end of my finger is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. To this day, it will still strike awe in me. Now, you can also induce it when there's a universal appeal to artwork, okay? So they do these studies, and if there's a high degree of appreciation of a particular art piece, it's stunning, you can induce awe. And of course, childbirth can also, even the mere visualization or watching a film of childbirth can induce awe as well. But what it does, when you induce awe, when psychologists induce awe in someone, lo and behold, their feelings of uh, religiosity and spirituality are increased. So it becomes this circle, right? If someone is very spiritual and they have a spiritual moment, their awe goes up, but it works the other way too, where awe, when induced, increases uh, your feelings of spirituality. Induction of awe directs attention away from you and into the environment. Now, that environment may be to another person, or it could be to the, the environment as we refer to it here in terms of a sustainable environment, okay? And there's some differences. Awe induced by nature equals increased feelings of one to all other people. You no longer see yourself as just this one individual and it's all about me. You're thinking about all of us on the planet when you induce awe. Childbirth awe tends to increase your feelings of closeness to your friends and family in particular. So there's some subtle differences that they're finding. Why is it of relevance as our cities expand, having locations and opportunities for all? Quite frankly, it makes you a nicer person. And psychologists have looked at this as well. And they found that when you induce awe, and again, I will reiterate that psychologists use nature scenes to induce awe in these experiments, right? There's lots of references here. As I said, anyone that wants them, please contact me. It decreases impatience, right? It, it, it makes you feel like you have more time. That was one of the more impressive recent studies, that when you induce awe, oh, I feel like I've got more time to do things. Because the opposite of that, feeling time crunched, are you more likely, if you're feeling time crunched, are you more likely to say, oh, you go ahead, sir, no problem, right? No, the research is quite clear on this. When you feel time crunched, you hold on to your own resources. You don't share with other people. You have more depressive symptoms. The long and the short of it is you're very stressed out. And very importantly, you don't do the lifestyle, the public health activities. If you feel a time crunch, you're not going to be eating the best of foods. If you feel a time crunch, you're not going to be physically active as you know you should be. Research is quite clear on that as well. So in some of these tests, again, awe provokes the experience, uh, the choice of experience of compared to material goods. In other words, if you induce awe, I want to get uh, you know, a Broadway show in, in terms of watch becomes more appealing. Experience becomes more appealing, right? And it provokes, even in a second, momentary life satisfaction, okay? Now, as I said, blue space, desert-like areas, forests, they can all produce spiritual inspiration. Relatedness, wonder, oneness, right? Complete awareness of the present moment. That's what a spiritual experience is all about when it's induced by nature. As I said here, there it is down in the fourth bullet. Induced by nature does not require, if we're expanding urban settings and talking about this, uh, the necessity of nature and green space, we do not need to bring the Grand Canyon to the greater Boston area. It doesn't have to be that big. But the key point here is that spiritual experiences provide opportunity for further reflection and improvement in resolution of personal difficulties. And very, very importantly, the last bullet down, and this is where it starts to come full circle to sustainability and such conversations. When you feel that way, you are more likely to stand up and say, yes, I'm for the environment. I'm here to protect the environment. Now, whether it's a spiritual experience, which has been shown in the research, or whether it's your connectedness to nature, 
you are more likely to have subsequent pro-environmental attitudes. And that is where uh, the research is shifting, and in my mind, not a moment too late. We need opportunity. I don't want to take up too much time. I'm right. feeling guilty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fuck, you got to say. Sure. Early. I want everyone to, be, to share. And, and really, we're winding down. We want everyone. Opportunity is the key, right? We need to provide equitable opportunity in at-risk communities for all. That's what we're talking about here. Opportunity. And just to, to wind down here, nature connectivity. Psychologists have scales for this. They actually can see to what degree someone is connected to nature. And when they do that, lo and behold, they find that your overall psychological well-being, your vitality, your meaningfulness is stronger. Strong connections between nature connectivity and personal well-being are found, are found broadly among the general population. It doesn't matter whether you're an executive, a civil servant, uh, a student. The scientists have found that this exists for all of us. And again, as I mentioned, the higher you score on your connectedness to nature scale, the more likely you are to have pro-environmental attitudes as well. And mindfulness and contemplation is the bridge here, right? So we've discussed quite a bit of research, from MRIs to land use data and so on. But here, today, contemplation, mindfulness, Canadian researchers found among their, their students, it was a group of 450 university students, and they found, yeah, there is a connection between your connection to nature and your health. But the higher that these folks scored on mindfulness, that was the bridge. That was what took it to being significant, highly significant, right? So in the end, the relationship between connection to nature and psychological resilience, it's mediated by experience, and we need to afford opportunity for experience. My last slide here is pro-social affirmations. And this is from uh, Dr. Richard Ryan, who's done wonderful studies in this area, brilliant man. And he found that when he got his students to visualize nature, right, they had more, they were more willing to share. You know how the psychologists, they set up these experiments to determine, to determine how much of your monopoly money or whatever you would share to your other participants? When they visualized nature, or when they saw scenes of nature, they were more likely to share. And then he upped the ante. He actually took, put four plants in a room, two potted plants on a floor and a couple around a desk. And they had no idea. These young students came into the room. They have no idea they're being manipulated this way. And all of a sudden, more, more pro-environmental attitudes, of course, but subsequent sharing and generosity. So that's the notion here. That all of this, there's a broad conversation. And I've just given an appetizer here, and I hope that it sets the table for many of the conversations that will unfold uh, for the rest of the day. And I'm excited about it myself. Well, thank you very much.